Well, thank you to the organizers for letting me come and talk to you today about subjects that I have spent a lot of time on and, and I think are interesting. Maybe you'll have to decide that. Um, but um, so let me get started. So uh, I'm going to start by a little bit of the history of how the FDA has reviewed. Um, you know, Dr. Lippman has gone over this in more detail than I will, but my orientation will be specifically in relation to uh, the certified uh, color additives in ADHD. So this process of reviewing this area, as uh, Dr. Marty indicated, started with the Feingold hypothesis and the idea of elimination diets. And in 1982, um, NIH held what they call a consensus development conference, and they listened to the evidence for the Feingold hypothesis and brought in a number of scientists in order to uh, evaluate the data that existed for the idea that elimination diets improve the behavior of children who have hyperactivity. In 1986, uh, one of the FDA's uh, advisory committees on hyperactivity um, in, re in relationship to food constituents generally, not colors alone, but any food constituent, uh, concluded that there was no evidence of behavioral disorders from food ingredients. Um, then in, in 2007, what uh, Dr. Stevenson's data, uh, what is often called the Southampton study, and in this case, it was the UK Food Standards Agency that authorized, and I guess funded this study of mixtures in three-year-old children and uh, eight- and nine-year-old children using the colors. I even tried to color them. Um, but uh, one of the things that came, became an issue after the study that I'm sure will be discussed was that some of the um, additives, the colors that are in those that mixtures are not actually approved uh, colors in the United States. Yellow number 10, Pons Ponsal 4R, and um, uh, F, uh, red number 10. So those weren't in the um, US, they're not approved by FDA. They did find evidence of some uh, uh, limited evidence, I would say, of mixtures affecting behavior. How much that effect is, is a question that we'll come back to. Then the European Food Safety Agency um, reviewed that study and it questioned the meaning of the small effect sizes in the Southampton study. And that's been an ongoing controversy back and forth about whether the effects, the magnitude of the effects, has been um, sufficiently important to um, represent a, a concern. EFSA also um, reviewed colors in Southampton study individually, and their conclusion was that there was no evidence of connection between the colors and behavior. And then, as uh, Dr. Lippmann referred to, the FDA held an advisory committee meeting on artificial food colors and hyperactivity. And again, not to repeat what he said, inconclusive evidence. And I was on that panel, and so I'd, I'd like to say something. Oh, and since then, there have been further reviews by WHO, their so-called JEFCA process, updating the reviews. And uh, they made no change in the standards for uh, the allowable food colors, um, except for lowering the ADI on yellow um, five. But the way the panel's ish, um, task was formulated is, I think, probably relevant to think about. So the process started because in 2008, Center for Science and the Public Interest petitioned FDA to ban eight of the nine FDA-certified colors citing the Sam Southampton study, but also citing a 2004 meta-analysis, and there's the citation, Schaub and Trin. And the FDA, as it was said, did their own first, started this process by doing their own review of the literature up to that time. And then they provided the advisory committee with the report that they had developed in reviewing the literature. And then they, had, and they asked the advisory committee to, to react to the report. The committee was told that they are free to go out and look at primary literature themselves, but the primary task was to review the FDA's review of the literature. Um, and this is, this is how the FDA looked at it, so I'm gonna quote them here. 
based on our review of the data from published literature, FDA concludes that a causal relationship uh, between exposure of food additives and hyperactivity in children in the general population has not been uh, uh, established. For certain susceptible children with ADHD and other problem behaviors, however, the data suggests that, there, that their condition may be exacerbated by exposure to a number of substances in food, including but not limited to synthetic food additives. Findings from relevant clinical trials indicate that the effects on their behavior appear to be due to a unique intolerance to, this, to these substances and not to an inherent neurotoxic properties. So you can see that there's some very subtle distinctions being made in the way that that language is formulated. So this is what the FDA posed to the advisory committee. Do the current relevant data support FDA's conclusion as set forth in the September 1, 2010 Interim Toxicological Review Memorandum that a causal relationship between consumption of certified food additives and color and hyperactivity in children in the general population has not been established. And so the committee was asked to make an up or down vote to that specific question. And this is how the committee responded. There were 16 members, and as you can see, the majority voted Yes, it had not been adequately established. So, you know, each person was, gave one vote, right? So, you know, that's how it went. Should additional information be disclosed on the product label of food containing certified food additives to ensure that they're safe? And then the committee had to vote on that question, and the majority voted no. So that's how that review process when. Now I want to take you to that meta-analysis because I think the meta-analysis represents, in my view, probably the best overall look at, at the literature up until the time it was uh, published in 2004. And this is a standard way of looking at effect sizes across the different studies. And you know, you can see the central tendency is shown by the dot on each horizontal line and zero represents, and they've got a nice label at the top that says AFCs, harmful is to the right, um, not harmful is to the left. So, um, oops, that's mislabeled to the left, <laughs> sorry. Um, and you can see where your eye takes you in terms of the general trend. So this is what their conclusion was. If we assume a normal distribution of response to artificial food colors, this change represents a shift from the 50th to the 61st percentile of hyperactivity for the average hyperactive child. So the net, and the effect size is 0.28, so about 0.3, which is a sort of a moderate effect size. It's not nothing. Now, they said some interesting things in the discussion that I think are worth paying attention to. First of all, they noticed that it's not, the studies don't just suggest an association in children with hyperactivity, but that there are other children who may not have hyperactivity or ADHD that seem to be sensitive. So if you look at it that way, sort of a Venn diagram I created that, there's an overlapping area of people who, kids who respond to them, some of whom don't have ADHD. Here's another sort of interesting issue that I think might turn out to be important and for some reason that I don't understand, no one's followed up on it, but the parents of the children who were in these studies reported insomnia and irritability in their children associated with the food additives more than hyperactivity as the symptom that seemed to be linked to the food additive. And it is amazing to me that no study that I know of has followed up on that observation. And it might, in fact, be quite important. So um, this is just a, a listing of FDA-approved uh, food colors, which Dr. Lippmann has already shown you. But I just put those arrows there to show you what kind of studies they were based on, the approval. They're all based on long-term feeding studies. And Dr. Lippmann was kind enough to give me those two updates. They're listed off to the side. Um, in 1976, there were new studies testing for thyroid tumors, 
1971 new chronic studies done for European listing. So there have been a little bit of additional data, but not much. Not a single study used to approve colors looked at brain development and behavior. So they were all approved not on the basis of any systematic testing for that, because they're all sort of grandfathered. They were all approved long ago. So these are the FDA's you know, estimated exposures and the ADIs. You can see the ADIs are different for children than they are for adults, but that's just to give you some general sense of how the FDA regarded them as, as uh, you know, meeting being exposures being below the ADIs. Now, one of the things that's interesting, if you look at the Red Book, which is the Center for Science and Applied Nutrition standard for what a compound needs to be tested for in order to be approved, this is the list. I know that's small, but if you go to the Red Book, there's a lot of studies, animal studies listed for something to become approved. And what I want you to notice is that there is one for um, neurotoxicity, and it's rarely done. And the reason it's not is because these are all already approved. <laughs> so what does the FDA Red Book actually say should be done in the area of neurotoxicity? It says neurotoxicity screening testing, screening for neurotoxicity effects should be routinely carried out in a short-term subchronic toxicity studies with rodents, preferably rats, and non-rodents, preferably dogs, one-year studies in non-rodents and reproductive studies in rodents. And what should be done, and I just highlighted, they're supposed to be histopathology, but I highlighted number two, a functional battery of quantifiable observations and manipulative tests selected to detect signs of neurological behavior and physiological dysfunctions. The functional battery is already referred to as an expanded set of clinical observations. So if you don't know this field, I, one of the things I will tell you is that Clinical observations have been shown to be not very effective for decades. And this is just an expanded version of that. They go on to say the optional inclusion of other more sensitive, more objective indices of neurotoxicity, such as tests of learning and memory, and quantitative measures of sensory and motor function to supplement the basic screening of the developing and or mature offspring are encouraged, not required. So even today, if someone petitioned, it wouldn't be required that they do what they basically say are the better tests. This is what the EPA has for their developmental neurotoxicity tests, and I'm giving you this for comparison's sake. They require these exposures and these evaluation periods, and the tests are listed there um, in small print. Hard to see, sorry. Um, but I'm going to just mention a couple of these. First of all, this is what an F FOB, functional observational battery, is according to the EPA. And at the FDA, it's often called an Irwin battery, at least in the Division of Drug Safety it is. And these are the things that you're supposed to evaluate. First thing, it's observer rating. So a technician stands, takes the animal out of its cage, and puts it on a table and these are the things they're supposed to rate. The system is completely subjective. It's based on the point of view of the observer, and it's typically done as a scale. Like zero, they don't see the symptom. One, they see it mildly. Number two, it's moderate. Number three, it's, it's severe. However, my problem with the FOB, or any functional observation of battery, is if you look up and down these lists, their relationship to, this, to CNS is really not known. So example, so suppose that you see the animal looks more aroused or less aroused. What do you do with that? Where do you go in the brain to look for the substrate for that change? I mean, I could give you some guesses, but I don't really know. The ascending reticular activating system, that supports arousal. That's a complex structure. These tests are really general, and I'm going to give you some, show you some data and ask this question. Should functional observation batteries even be used in the evaluation of, of neurotoxicity? 
This study was done by the EPA after 30 years of receiving studies on pesticides, basically neurotoxins, right? Most of them are neurotoxins. Otherwise, they don't kill insects. So they had 78 studies on file, and they found that 69 of them met the standards where they could review them. And what tests worked to set the point of departure for risk assessment? Well, locomotor activity, 29% of the time it was the most sensitive indicator. 19% acoustic startle response. The FOB, 4%. If I tested a whole long list of neurotoxins and, only, and one of my tests only showed an effect 4% of the time, I'd drop that test, right? I mean, what do you need in order to drop a test? And I've said to the EPA, really, do you need 69 additional studies? That's probably the largest database of animal developmental neurotoxicity studies you will ever see. Isn't it time to rethink that? Over at FDA on the drug side, this is just an example of a study I took out of the literature. It follows the Center for Drug Safety approach, this happens to be a juvenile tox design, but the developmental one is exactly the same. And up in the right-hand corner, I put the tests, acoustic startle habituation, rotor rod, which is like a treadmill, reflexes, open field locomotor activity, passive avoidance, T mazes, Beal and Cincinnati water mazes, Morris one. So these, you can select. There's no standard, there's no particular tests recommended. And why is that? If you go to other forms of toxicology testing, there are specifications of what you have to do. How many sections you have to take for pathology? What do you have to look for? But when it comes to behavioral outcomes, agencies have thrown their hands up in the air and said, we can't come to a consensus view on what should be done. So here's the list of areas that you need to cover. You can submit any test you want. And just to show you that um, organization uh, OECD has the, basically the same guideline. It's not really any different. I took this is an old slide, some things I'd marked for a lecture I gave, but fundamentally, again, it's just categories. It's not tests. So are these designs adequate? So a couple years ago, I asked the question, well, what should we be doing? Let's start from scratch and throw out everything and have a blank slate and ask the question, what should we be doing? And to do that, I decided to go to the human literature. This is the paper that I reviewed this topic with my graduate students and postdoc. And this is a summary. There's a whole series of tables in this paper. But I just wanted to give you the bottom line. So here are a whole list of known, established developmental neurotoxins as documented in children, lead, methylmercury, manganese, pesticides, not all pesticides, some pesticides, PCBs, uh, PBDEs, bisphenol A, cocaine, alcohol, marijuana, methamphetamine, and tobacco products. So we already know from 40 years of prospective epidemiological studies in children that these are harmful to children. Now, what's affected? What are the main outcomes that you see? And I've given you a little list. I know this is a tedious list. You can't look at, all, at the whole thing. But I just tried to give the highlights. This is not an exhaustive review. But I want you to notice what kinds of things are affected. Full-scale IQ, performance IQ, achievement, attention, memory, reading, aid, increases in ADHD. And you go down that list, and I think you will see that there is a pattern, and it's higher cognitive functions. So what do we know about the relationship? What have we learned in neuroscience? OK, so I was trained as a neuroscience, so I got to give you this. So you know, what do we know about brain structure function relationships? We know where a lot of higher functions are mediated. For example, cerebral cortex. We know working memory is stored in the cortex. The hippocampus and parahippocampal regions are responsible for, in humans for declarative and spatial learning, and in animals, spatial learning. Since they don't talk, we don't talk about declarative memory. We talk about spatial, and we have tests for it, tests that are surprisingly specific. The Morris water maze, for the striatum and brainstem, 
procedural memory. Five minutes, thank you. We have egocentric, and then for emotional memory, the amygdala, and we have tests for that in animals. So if we take that little diagram I just showed you, I sat down with someone, Dr. Kim Yolton, at Children's Hospital, who does children's long-term longitudinal studies, and I ask her this question. If we look at what is measured in these children's studies, what measures that you take, and they're listed there, what tests are given, and we know that those are the ones that show up in my table as affected in children, can we line up animal studies that are parallel to them so that we're testing the same functions? And my arrows are trying to show you the matchup. Okay, you can read across or you can follow those lines. So if that's true, we should revise our whole thinking about developmental neurotoxicity. And this is just a first pass effort. I'm actually trying this in my laboratory to do exactly what I showed you on the previous slide to see if it will work better than what we're currently doing. So now I'm gonna give you my personal take on where things stand. Are artificial food colors neurotoxic? The studies are mixed, you know this, but the methods have not always been the best. But nevertheless, I think the weight of the evidence as of right now is that they're not neurotoxic but do they affect behavior? That's a different question than whether they're neurotoxic because neurotoxicity implies some kind of permanent damage to the brain. But an effect that occurs, a change in behavior that occurs while they're on and then goes away when they're off, that's not neurotoxicity, not, not as people in my field would define it. No new studies are available that speak to this particular issue. And why is that? Is it not an FDA priority? I actually don't know, I can't read the mind of FDA. Is it a lack of funds by FDA? Well, FDA doesn't generally fund studies extramurally. And I can tell you for a fact, NIH has absolutely no interest in this topic. You submit a grant application, you will get nowhere. How about industry? Does industry have a vested interest in funding new studies? Well, I would ask this question, they're already on the market, so why would you spend millions additional dollars. The colors approved before the developmental of neurotoxicity as a field. This field isn't even that old. So they were already approved by the time this field emerged. And in our early studies, I'll admit, because I did a number of them, they didn't necessarily were the best or what I would do today. Do um, artificial food colors cause ADHD-like behavior in the general population? Apparently not. Uh, but the individual of subpopulations of sensitive kids is not resolved. Do artificial colors trigger ADH symptoms in those with ADHD? I think the meta-analysis suggests that yes, in a subset of ADH children, they probably do um, exacerbate behavior, but also that insomnia and irritability, not just ADHD symptoms. What should be done? New human studies, I think that would be great. Who's gonna pay for them? New animal studies, I'm all in favor of it. Who's gonna fund them? Decertification by FDA, without more decisive data, I don't think that's gonna happen. New labeling, well what should the label say? Replacement, these could be replaced, potentially. Industry could develop perhaps new ones but remember, if they had a new one, remember that list of red book studies? They'd have to do all those. So, and the industry would have to face this issue. How do they know in advance if the new ones would prove to be any better than the old ones? In terms of their, I mean, now they'd be scrutinized much more closely than in the past. Maybe they wouldn't pass successfully through the gauntlet of red book tests. So thank you very much for your time. Those are my thoughts on the issue.
Th thank you, that was very interesting. Um, I had a question on your Venn diagram and um, standard setting and labeling. Um, in 1996, I think the Food Quality Protection Act was passed and that directed EPA to set standards that included an additional modifying factor if there was information lacking on outcomes for children. Um, so when we talk about, and it also um, obligated EPA to set food tolerances that protect vulnerable populations like, like children. So is it, if you were to take that Venn diagram and extend it to perhaps setting standards for, for food dyes, is there a missing piece there that we should be protecting vulnerable populations and, and what would that possibly look like? Well, as, you, as I think you know, the, the, the sort of standard safety factors are 100 for variability among humans, a factor of 10 for variability between animals and humans, and then under the uh, Food Quality Protection Act, another 10 standard if children are shown to be more sensitive. And so that gives you a safety factor of 1,000. But if you look at the ADIs that FDA has calculated, many of them would meet that standard still. But it all depends on what the actual exposures are, and that's an issue, and the exposure assessments are complicated. Uh, FDA has often had to resort to, well, how much is made, and then the default assumption is, if this is much is manufactured, it's all going into the diet one way or another. So you do sort of this gross population-based estimate, and they've done that but they would like to get more specific information because children eat foods with more colors and of course their body mass is lower, so you get higher exposures in children. So they are different for children. They'd like to get better data on actual consumption of food colors. But as far as I know, they haven't been in the receipt of more update information. But that's. The Food Quality Protection Act is enforced. I know it's enforced, that extra safety margin at EPA. And I believe FDA uses it. But in the case of the food additives, I think their assumption is, well, those are all based on 100. But I think they could probably impose another 10. And some of those, would, they're, based on their estimates, would still fall below the ADI. So that's the problem or issue. Yes. Uh, Andy Rubin with the Department of Pesticide Regulation. Uh, in view of your pessimism, I would say, with respect to the FOB uh, behavioral studies uh, in animals, can you point to any, uh, are there any neurohistopathological endpoints that are perhaps more uh, effective? You, I mean, I'm, you probably already know the answer to this. Neuropathology has not proven to be very effective for looking at subtle changes to the brain. The problem is the brain is so complicated that you don't know where to look and what to measure. And the way FDA and other agencies do histopathology, it's very rudimentary. So it just it doesn't detect anything. I mean, the, the thousands of different markers you really have to use to do a thorough examination isn't something that's practical. I mean, a developmental neurotox says, says the, I'm told by industry costs a million and a half dollars. If you added an intensive neuropath, I don't know where that price would go, but way up. Uh, Dr. Voorhees, uh, Sean Taylor, thank you very much. It was a really interesting presentation. I, I do have one of the questions, um, or one of the questions I have is related to the study design. And I'm certainly not an expert and I can't comment on the specific study design for the sort of new developmental neurotox study. But can you talk a little bit about what the potential pathway would be for that? So you, you're you doing some work with this in your lab now. Um, if this shows promise, how do you think this could potentially lead to something that would have regulatory value? Um, would it end up with a standard guideline? What's the validation process, et cetera? Well, for example, for space, let me take spatial learning, for example. We know what parts of the hippocampus mediate that form of learning. Not only that, we know which neurotransmitter is principally involved, it's glutamate. We know the principal receptors, NMDA receptors. So, and we know that the CA1 region specifically is critical for spatial learning and it's mediated 
by NMDA receptors and AMPA receptors. So if you found a, an effect on spatial learning, you already know where to start looking in the brain. So you can work upstream. That's the whole value. The basic science has shown us you can go from these mechanisms to the behavior and back. So it seems to me, why aren't we using that knowledge in the regulatory arena to say we can do these same tests that have been, in effect, validated in neuroscience, and then if we find something, go back upstream. We know at least where to start looking. And I think you can do the same thing for the striatum, the same thing for the amygdala, and down the line. So again, to me, as a neuroscientist, it's structure-function relationships that what are what we want in the end, so that we can establish mechanisms. But the, since we know behavior is more sensitive, we don't want to start with the mechanisms. We don't know the mechanisms of the effects that are purportedly associated with changes from artificial food colors. So let's start with the behavior and go upstream, and then we'll know where to look. Thank you. <laughs>